All right, people, welcome. Welcome to this episode of the Vision to Mission podcast. Today, we have two very, very special guests, and we have a very relevant, important, and, and touching topic that we're talking about today. We're going to be talking about the area of mental health, and in particular, we're going to talk about men's mental health and, and why it's so prevalent in our country today and why it's so important that we have a conversation on this. So first, let me just welcome our, our first and main guest here, who is Mr. Ryan Grubb. He is a professional pastoral counselor. He's a coach, therapist, father, husband, and a very good friend of our family. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Always great to be with you guys. Yes. And last but most deaf, not least, we have my wife. Yes, believe it or not. Uh, Soon to be, at some point, Dr. Jennifer Thorpe, right? That's what everyone's <laughs> saying. So she actually hosts the very popular um, Pure Social podcast, and she also has her master's in social work. And she is also, she is um, a, a great resource for uh, young women and teens who are looking for guidance in their life. So this is this promises to be a fantastic conversation. Jen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, babe. Thanks for the intro. All righty. So here we go. So over the last several years, there's been so much that's happened in this country uh, from a, a, a larger perspective with regards to, you know, riots, with regards to shootings, uh, with regards to so many uh, just, dom you know, the domestic issues, household issues. There is clearly a, an issue with regards to as a country that we have with with mental health. And so, I mean, I grew up in the city of Baltimore and, you know, one of the things that kind of looking back in retrospect what that I noticed kind of growing up with older men, right, uh, was that they may have turned, they, they were working hard, right, to support their families. Some weren't, but there was a lot of issues in terms of turning to to drugs, turning to violence, turning to to gangs, turning to things so that they could men could get a sense of fulfillment, a sense of belonging, right? A sense of grounding. Uh, and, you know, looking at that growing up, I was like, you know, that's not, that was not something that I wanted to turn to at a very young age. Um, I had gone to Catholic church for a good portion of my life in Catholic school. So God was introduced to me in a very, at a very early age, which I'm grateful for. But unfortunately, there's so many people that they, you know, didn't have God introduced to them per se um, so early in their lives. And so they were turning to other things uh, again for that gratification, right. And for that sense of fulfillment in their lives. And <clears throat> I would really think that with everything that we've gone through, over the past several years, uh, and there's there's been talk about dealing with mental health, which is so important. But you two, as being experts in this field, uh, I really want to hear what your perspectives are from a broad um, from a broad po point of view uh, to be able to give some context, uh, you know, to our audience today. So Ryan, I'm going to start with you so that you can provide some context. Give us a little bit, just a couple of minutes of your background and history, how you even got into study, uh, studying the area of mental health and how you got into the profession. Yeah, no problem. Well, I was born. No, I'm just kidding. That's mm. But, uh, you know, back in 1998, um, after going to college uh, at the University of Tennessee at Martin, and um, <clears throat> kind of growing up in, and I grew up in uh, D.C. a little bit outside of D.C. Montgomery County. I was on the, the Montgomery County side. I moved, moved to Memphis. When I when I got out of college, um, I was not in a good space. And then one thing led to another. I got into the full time ministry, and I really started to understand what I wanted to do in a sense of serving people, helping people for career base. Um, I had no idea it would lead me to becoming a counselor and a therapist, but um, at the time I just knew I wanted to help people. I didn't care who they were, I didn't care what color they were. And I grew up that way in DC, moving to Memphis. I had a lot of, uh, let's just say stigmas show up at me. No, no African-Americans in my neighborhood, very, my, a lot of segregation, still the same today in that city. Uh, so I, I saw a lot of injustice but I really didn't make any moves forward at that point. 
long story short, once I became uh, involved in the ministry, I ended up back in Memphis leading a church with my wife of a week and learning that the <laughs> city that I actually burned down almost as a high school student was in need of a lot of repair. And so that kind of started my journey towards mental health. I had no idea that it would lead me to being a therapist or even a pastoral counselor, but that's where it kind of started. And, and I grew up in a pretty nice family. My, my mom and dad uh, were very supportive. I had everything I probably wanted and more. Uh, yet I was never really, really, I never really understood what it meant to work hard and play hard. And so I was burned out by the time I became a minister. And so I had already had the effect of depression and anxiety. I didn't know what it was. And of course, in the middle class, upper class, white genre, we didn't talk about that stuff. It wasn't talked about. You just worked hard and you just provided and you were a good person. And I was like, no, something's wrong because my brain and my body aren't functioning properly. So as I was in the ministry for a while and, you know, served several different ways, served as a campus minister, a church leader, an associate pastor. Once I completed different different journeys, I knew I still wanted to be involved in something. Uh, I tried to go back to the corporate world and that was a hot disaster. And so when I returned from my job about a year after I left the ministry, my wife said, hey, why don't you go back to school? We have the income. Here's an opportunity for you. And that's what I did. So I went back and completed my degree through Liberty uh, online. I did it in two years. And now I'm about at the point right now where I'm finishing all my residential hours and getting ready to obtain my certification for professional licensure. And that's how I got here. So uh, and I work in Waynesboro, which is about 20 miles north of Charlottesville. And I love what I do. I, live, I work with a great group of people. It's a 42-year-old firm, and we work with a variety of people in the psychodynamic theory range, which is a little bit of a combination between the Freudian, uh, the cognitive, the existential, and the solution focus. So people can actually feel like their past is not controlling them, but they can actually start to imitate new patterns and processes. No, definitely appreciate that. And Jen, can you share with our audience um, kind of your beginnings into the mental health field as well? So, <clears throat> so I actually had got my degree in sociology at Rutgers University, and I had started the social work program then, but I had unresolved trauma in my own life that I didn't realize until I started reading certain books that, wow, I'm really triggered here. Um and so moving forward, years later, went back to school, got my master's in social work, and really after working through some things, and I will say if you've ever experienced any type of trauma, you realize that throughout your life, you still need to continually grow. And hopefully if you see areas you need help, please continue to seek help. I know I have, and I know that helps me. Um, but I, at the same time for me, when I went back to school, I was no longer being triggered and having the opportunity during my residential time, I was able to work with people in a clinical setting. And it was a very healthy time where there was no projecting and I was able to really have an impact. But the reason why I wanted to go back to school was because I've grown up in a culture in a church where we really do believe it's important to provide mentorship and where we believe it's important to really help one another and to navigate. But what I had found was that I was having relationships with amazing people who, like me, who had experienced different areas of trauma or even just disruptions in their marriage, things going on with their children, um, within different areas of life uh, that was affecting them, not just mentally, but emotionally, physically. And I really felt that at a certain point I was like, you know, when you just give advice and you just say, pray about it, you're doing harm. Um, and for me, it was a, a certain aspect where I was like, I need to be educated. And when I wasn't, I, I learned that I need to say, hey, maybe you should talk to someone else about this. I've had to learn to say, this is my scope. With that being said, I am not an expert, but I love mental health. It is my passion and I am thriving to um, continue to help people. And I know for myself, I would love to be a clinical, a uh, licensed clinical social worker is what my goal is. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with different people in different settings. And my goal is to continue to do that. 
But what I do appreciate is all of the teachings and the learnings and the people that I've been able to be around. And I am more and more passionate about, which is why I started my podcast about the fact that we're human beings. We have a unique Mm -hmm. human experience and that we really do need help. We need tools that for many of us, we didn't get in our families, even if we came from quote unquote good families that we just didn't either talk about um, I know I came from a Latin culture and uh, mental health is something that you do not discuss as well. And specifically when we come to men, um, there's a word called machismo where you're very proud and you work hard and you push through, but I'm sure for different cultures, it means different things. Um, but what I really found was that it's just something that's not discussed and mm-hmm. words such as being weak or, um, not be, vulnerability, intimacy can be really challenging. And so um, specifically when dealing with with men issues um, that I have found, even when talking with certain clients, I remember just hearing, man, you know, like I can't say something like that. I don't even want to say something like that out loud. And it just kind of opened the window to a whole other world that I really don't understand. Uh, but it, but I want to understand it and I want to have a platform where people can at least be encouraged to recognize signs if they need help, number one, <clears throat> and then to be able to have resources as to where to go, number two. But in the interim, while they're working through that space to hopefully have some tools to navigate some challenging times. And so for me, that's a little bit about my background. Um, I love learning um, and I definitely love CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, um, something that I really do believe is so important. And I definitely want to, throughout this podcast, talk to you, Ryan, because you did an amazing job at a mental health workshop recently. And I'd love for you to be able to talk a lot about the mindset and how just how our sure. mind really does affect us and provide some of that psychoeducation that you are able to do. Sure. No question. So why don't we just transition to that? So uh, Ryan, can you go ahead and just share, give us an overview of what you shared at the mental health workshop here in Northern Virginia um, a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. I had the privilege of coming up and uh, being in Fredericksburg and sharing uh, some information about how uh, how the mind actually operates. And I think it's a really a uh, it's a false deception. So mental health gets separated from religion. It gets separated from business. It gets separated from relationships and partnerships and you know, whatever, anything that's normal, mental health, the mind is involved in everything. So when I'm thinking about the mind and how the mind works, we don't, we need to conjugate the mind. And so what I mean by that is we don't need to know where the amygdala is and the, and the hippocampus and all the little details that a neuroscientist would do because neuroscientists study the brain itself and the pieces. When I talk about the mind, I'm talking about thoughts, feelings, and actions, and I'm talking about them in that order because what we don't understand is 90% of what we do is unconscious. Hmm. So if 90% of what I do is unconscious, that means I go to the store, I get in the car, I drive, I put on the same radio, the same music, the same Spotify. I go to the same aisle in the store. I get the same loaf of bread. I go to the same checkout where Miss Ann is, who's 87 years old and has been working at the grocery store <laughs> since you know Lincoln was president. Um, I come back in, I do the same thing. I walk the same steps and I get in the same car in the same place kind of like the Lego movie, you know, structure is fine, but unconsciousness is blind. So if I'm unconscious, then I'm surviving. Mm. 10% of what we do is conscious on average. People can argue, oh, it's 12. Oh, it's 15. That's fine. Go ahead. Argue. I'm not listening. 10% is the average. Why do I say 10%? Remember the whole story when we were in college back in the day? We only use 10% of our brain in school. They always use that, right? That was their motivation to say we need to learn more. more. Well, it's impossible for us to do that unless our unconscious has changed. And our unconscious holds the paradigm, which is a process and multitude of habits, hostage until we do what? Allow ourselves to change gears. Think about what you do every morning. If you sit in the same exact spot, Every single morning, even if you're studying your Bible, or you read the same way, or you, and I'm not telling you to change everything, but you don't add any substance to it. It's like trying food, right? If you don't try a new food, my mom used to say, you, you need to try this. I go, I don't like it. She goes, you never tried it. She was right. I didn't try it. How do I know what it tastes like until I try it? But we don't do that because we're comfortable in our unconsciousness. Unconsciousness 
is another word for emotional survival. It's the reptilian brain. It's what the reptilian brain has been based for. Back in the day when the, when the earth was first formed, I would imagine that the individuals walking around had to use that reptilian brain in order to live. I mean, they had saber-toothed tigers and you had this and you had no, it wasn't like you had a cable and you had AAA to call. Okay. So, but over time we had to learn how to think. And so in that thought process, in the top of the consciousness, you got your intuition, you have your imagination. These are thinking modalities that if not used properly, we just survive. Have you ever heard somebody say overthinking? I'm overthinking that. I'm just overthinking. Absolutely. The definition of overthinking is worry. It's fear, it's anxiety, it's doubt, it's hopelessness. We are going to have those times. But my point is, if you survive in that, then you thrive in that. So the thriving we do is <laughs> conniving. You can call it whatever. It's, it, you're diving deeper into trauma. So you have to understand what the mind wants you to do. That means if you're going left all the time, you might want to go right today. Even as simple as driving to work in a different pattern can change your conscious awareness. And it does so because you see different things. So I'll give you another example. Today I drove uh, into town about 6 a.m. this morning for a discipleship group with this church I go to. And I drove in. And it was very foggy. And I, I got to this place. I was like, I don't even know how I got here. But I was away. I was because the fog had covered Everything around me, the road was clear, everything, and I didn't know which light I was. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm already here. And so when we do that normally in an everyday setting, we forget the fact that we have a mind that can consciously attack good things and good things <clears throat> to create new results. So if the mind is mostly unconscious and doesn't change, then the body responds through that unconsciousness. And disease, suppression, and all kinds of things that we don't want show up. We go, well, what do you mean we don't want them? Well, we do want them because what you think about is what you become. William James said that in 1903 at Harvard. He was the, he's the father of American psychology, William James. That's what they said. He said, what we think about is what we will become. Now, there's a lot to that. There's a God purpose and all that stuff. I'm not saying, please, people, you hear me say this. It doesn't mean I'm, I am become a scientific, you know, I'm not Scientologist here. No offense. I'm just not. That. But what I'm saying is if we act in a certain manner, we're going to get that rapport back. We're going to get that alignment back. If we think every client we meet with is going to be negative, then it's over. You're going to get negativity and they probably won't stay. I'll just come in as a therapist though, because you have to meet them where they are and allow that manifest to declare the change. So that's a little bit about, I, I could keep going here. I mean, is this the, but, but constant unconscious programming is what the minds uh, needed know-how is. We don't, we're not educated about what the mind can do. We, we live in our senses like see, taste, touch, smell here, but we don't add intuition to it. We don't add imagination to it. We don't add will to it. We don't add reasoning to it. And then we expect change. Well, I did all these things right. I showed up for church. I showed up for Bible study. I did this. I did that. I opened my Bible and I'm like, or I went to work. I'm like, did you do anything else? No, I don't really need to think because it's just a simple thing. Well, then you're unconscious. And then this, this affects marriages. It affects children and their parenting, not allowing kids to actually speak up because we're afraid of the fear that might come out or what they might turn into or spouses who are not hurt or subjugated all their lives like my wife was for years with me until I had to realize that the conscious intent I have to have is just step back and let her be and things will work its way out. So that's just a taste. I don't want to take up the whole you know, segment. Oh, this is why we're here. So let, then let me ask you both this question. Would you then argue that there is a certain percentage of unconsciousness that's actually healthy and good? So for example, <clears throat> If we unconsciously, you know, every day we have a certain pattern of behavior, you, you get up, you brush your teeth, you go to the bathroom, you take a shower. If you're a parent and you have younger children, you know to take care of your kids, right? Help them to get dressed, yeah. make sure they're fed. Like I would assume a good portion of that is unconscious because it's a continued pattern of behavior. 
And I would assume that that is very healthy. And what, one of the things you said reminds me, I had heard something Tony Robbins said years ago. He said, you ever, like you kind of just said, like you, he said, you ever go somewhere and you get there and you're like, how did I get here? Mm-hmm. You know, and I've done that a few times and I'm like, I just pulled up to my office. Like what? <laughs> like it just, it was just weird because I was either listening to something on the radio, my mind was somewhere else. <laughs> But I'm like, okay, I stopped at stop signs. I didn't go through red lights. I didn't cut anybody off. I got here safely. There has to be a certain amount of like that unconscious. But even if it's quote unconscious, you still have boundaries and safety that's somehow built in, right? Because you said it's a you said it's a survival mechanism. So we have to have a certain level of safety, right? And 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 you know, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves, you know, within that. So I guess my question to both of you is like, how do you, how do we begin to get, or how do we even understand what a, a good percentage is or a good balance is? Because a certain amount of unconscious behavior is very important. But at the same time, if you brush your teeth with your right hand, maybe you should try your left because it is something different because it makes you have different movement, right? Different mechanics. And it forces you to kind of, uh, you know, be different than you were before. So hopefully this is making sense. So kind of what would you say would be a a healthy balance there? Or how do we even get there? You you know, it's interesting because it sounds, um, so I'm sure many people who are listening, or at least I would think, um, have at least heard of the book Atomic Habits um, by James Clear. Clear, Um, And so it's interesting because as you talk about that, there are, there is a part of us that where we just form and we develop habits, those habits can either be ones that benefit us or cause harm. Right. Um, they can allow us to have success or to be not successful. But what, when I hear you talk about that, I do think there's a part of us that we get into patterns, which is human nature to get into patterns, to have developments, which is why uh, when we do sometimes go to therapy or when we do learn a new task and we're learning how to sometimes really, number one, recognize what are the things that cause us harm? What are the things that have injured us? I love um, when Ryan mentioned early on about, you know, our thoughts and then, you know, our feelings and our behavior, because they have that that triangle. It has that impact on us as far as like how we think Mm. will eventually affect how we feel. And then we'll see a behavior of that. And as you were talking, it made me think about subconsciously, sometimes we're really not aware of how we feel. For example, if you were to even ask someone, what are you feeling? A lot of times they'll say the word fine, which isn't a feeling. Um, And I do want to get into the mental health piece specifically with men. So I'm going to be concise here. But I think we don't often have the language, number one, I really believe. Um, We have over a hundred emotions. And a lot of times we only recognize happy, sad, um, And we don't really, we kind of go into the red light, green light type of things, even we do with our kids. And we don't really develop the language, number one, for how we feel or what it is we're thinking. And as a result, even with our physical activity, as we start to do things, sometimes we don't even know why. I know for myself, um, I find myself in situations sometimes like, why did I say that? Or why did I think that? Or even when I've expected um, my children And I've had to be reminded of, you know, your daughter probably doesn't even know why she said that or did that. And that is so true because subconsciously we're oftentimes we're not aware. And so I think um, it's important for us to develop a sense of awareness. And a big part of that is learning how to be mindful. And again, that's something in our culture that we don't do. We often don't take the time to be still, to be present. And who teaches that? I didn't start teaching that until I went to school. Um, and so even just this morning, I was on the way to school with my one daughter and I said, okay, we're going to do some five deep breaths. And then we did some box breathing and that's just holding, taking a deep breath for a count of four, holding for a count of four, breathing out for a count of four, and then holding again. And there's a hold in between there. And I was just giving her that tool to have because there was a test coming up and we were just kind of working through that. But because of that, she was able to articulate what she was feeling. Had I not had any of that training, I would not have known to do that with her. I might have even said something that wouldn't have been helpful, like, don't worry about it. Like, no, she's thinking about it. So let me give her the space to Mm. articulate that. Uh, But I think even more so when we get into men, so often I knew I grew up hearing it. Don't cry. um, Get over it. um, You know, 
eso no es nada, like that's nothing. Um, just different things that I know that I would hear my cousins here, um, that, you know, you push through it, you know. And if someone did start to cry, the few times I would see it, they were demeaned or um, mm. they were put down or made fun of, not just by the adults, but also by the kids, you know. And so I think as you kind of go into that, I would love to kind of, as after you answer this question, I would love to kind of maybe go back into like just the men and how it's, how it affects them. Maybe these, I love the article, so you can pull that up at some point whenever you're ready, but the things that affect men, because um, one thing I was thinking about is over 60% of women will be more likely to talk and more likely to even reach out and get help at least once. The numbers for men are like with, between the 20s and the 30s. And that's if they even go to talk. And I'm not talking about just, I think the word therapy can turn people off. Right. Um, they may more likely be willing to join a class <clears throat> exercising or some form. I, um, I know the person who does our um, podcast helps out, but he does um, like jujitsu. They're likely to do something like a craft, like whether it's wood, wood, activities. A lot of men, when they experience depression, you'll find them doing tons of activities um, in and out of the house. Um, and so I wanted to kind of dive into that because you have masculinity that can affect it. Culture can affect it. And even early on, um, I know from inner city, Brandon was talking about one of the things I want to mention is a lot of people go to bad things or things that are harmful because they simply want to escape. <laughs> Um, because they don't have other resources available to them or they're not aware of those other resources. Or even if they are, um, the other word I want to throw out there is pain. So I'm throwing these things out there uh, because we are also not accustomed to understand pain, to understand that it is a communication of how we're doing, of how we're feeling. Um, so there's a lot of different things, but I want to throw different things out there. So as we go into the aspect of men and mental health, we can kind of navigate these things. And I want to really learn from you guys because you guys are the men. So I really want to hear what you're thinking and um, and how that and how that all aligns together. Absolutely. And so, Ryan, so what are some of your thoughts on what Jennifer shared? So let me let me answer the question real quick on the 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 whole. There's a part of a healthy. Unconscious. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There is. And so. But I think it's it's the it's the foundation, it's the platform of that, because you have to take the healthy unconscious and then you have to equip it with the actual conscious. So the thoughts and feelings can be healthy together so the body can respond with proper proper ambition. Okay. You can go to the gym all your life and watch people you ever watch people go to the gym and they, they gain weight. They keep doing the same thing over and over again, they gain weight. They're not using their mentality to change it. So there is a healthy part of unconsciousness, mm. discipline. But what you do with it after that is is the difference. You can get into the pro league, but to win the Super Bowl, you got to do something different. You're going to have to audible. Well, so that's the part. So I 100% agree with that. And so as for men, let's talk about men. This is a – we got, what, six hours, eight hours here on this one? That's cool. <laughs> it's a long time. So um, <clears throat> culture, environment, genre, genes – um, embarrassment, uh, weakness. Uh, I grew up in Montgomery County, but my family's from West Virginia. And so like the inner city, that's the outer city, but it's the same. There's sim much similar things. You don't cry. You, 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 you buckle up. I mean, the, most of the men that I knew in my family died before they were 50. And most of them were, they played hard. They worked hard. They were coal miners. They were interstate workers. My grandfather put the interstate systems in, in West Virginia and Virginia, 81, 64, 77, all those were him. But he died of asbestos from his work. So you didn't talk about weakness. You didn't talk. You smoked cigarettes. You drank. You you chewed tobacco. You Now, I didn't grow up in the state of West Virginia, but my last name is Grub. Okay? <laughs> so it's in my blood, right? So our response <clears throat> to weakness was, we ain't weak. We're good old boys who get it done. And so to answer our, the question, this is going to be a great conversation because there's so much that goes into this. There's so much that men, some men refuse it, but some men don't understand how to get it. So when I say that, you said you mentioned something about therapy, right? They don't want to go to therapy. 
one of the things I do with the guys I work with, I work with a lot of men. I have a lot of men. I have men that are 70 years old and married and, or single. I have men that are 14 and 15 years old. Okay. I call them men because they're men. They're my boys. They come in here. The first thing I do is I tell them, I say, I'm not going to ask you how you feel because you wouldn't come in here if you told, if you knew that. And they look at me and they're like, what's wrong with you? I go, <laughs> everything. Let's talk. And so <laughs> letting down the guard to the individual is the first step. And I think mental health, especially in the therapy world, more men, hear me, men, you need to get your degree in mental health. Okay. If you want to help solve the problem, but the problem remains, they're not safe. No matter what that problem is. And so. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with Jen. I mean, it could be, I mean, I didn't grow up, I'm not Latino, as you can tell. <clears throat> so, you know, but I didn't grow up in that. In the, but the machismo, when you said that, I thought about, oh, yeah, 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 we're walking around. Yeah, we're tight. We got this figured out. When inside, we're dying. When inside, we're, we're falling apart, whether it's because there's addiction in our family for generations or there is the message of we just don't talk about that kind of stuff. You know, we don't bring that up. Um, you know, you got the Asian culture, you got the Latino culture, you got the, you know, African American culture, you got you got some cultures that are like, you know, where grandma and great grandma are involved. You got some cultures mm. where nobody's involved. You got some cultures where you don't look at people in the eye, like the Asian culture. You don't look in the eye because if you look in the eye, that's disrespect. So yeah, I, I hundred percent agree with Jen's um Observation. No, absolutely. And Anton, if you could bring up on the screen the article, there's an article from the Newport Institute, um, which talks about common male mental health symptoms. So it's actually entitled the five most common male mental health disorders. And so before we get into this article, I wanted to, you know, address a couple of things that you both had talked about, because it's, it's fantastic. When you talk about masculinity, right, in culture, you know, absolutely, because there's different cultures, different world um, and geographic cultures. And to me, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. It's really a matter of being secure versus being insecure, right? With your feelings and your emotions and really where do you get your security from? Is it validation from other people, you know, or, or, or whatever that is. And um, Ryan, as you had mentioned before, chewing tobacco and doing this that, and the other, it's so true because as men, by and large, but definitely not um, in total, we don't, we don't have the proper coping mechanisms to deal mm -hmm. with certain things. And I can even honestly say for myself, as Jennifer knows, when I am, you know, cause I've dealt with anxiety for years and still deal with it. So if I'm stressed or I, I'm anxious about something, if I'm worried or nervous, I will cut the grass. <laughs> I will do something in the garage. Um, I will vacuum. I will clean up. I will do something with my hands, right? You, and something productive because it, it, it's, it's, it's an escape. You know, it kind of takes me away from what I'm thinking about, what I'm worrying about. And it kind of puts me into more of a happy place. I go back, okay, I can do something and I can actually see something completed and done. Right. And that's for me personally, that's one of my coping mechanisms. But unfortunately, for different men, they don't have those coping, you know, healthy, let's say coping mechanisms, you know, to deal with that. And unfortunately, there are a lot of men that don't have a spiritual or a faith base or foundation in their life. So they, they don't have God, well, they do have God to turn to, but they're not consciously doing it, right? Or they don't have other men in their lives that they can have open uh, conversation with to to get some feedback and get some um, some help. And so, which is why I'm so happy that, you know, I have that in my life and I realize how important it is. And I even see on a, on a daily basis how Jennifer has mastered this art from talking to different women and being open with them. And it, it's just has helped her to help herself and help so many other people as a result. So we're looking at this, this article and uh, you know, Ryan, I want to get some of your thoughts on this. So again, uh, common male mental health symptoms, and we'll put the link uh, in the show notes. And it says here, men don't tend to talk openly about their emotional struggles, such as feeling sad, worthless, or hopeless. Instead, male mental health conditions often manifest themselves in, in symptoms such as aggression and violence, which unfortunately we've seen far too much um, 
you know, over the last few years, high risk activities, substance abuse, physical issues such as chronic headaches or stomach aches, feelings of restlessness and difficulty focusing, appetite and weight changes, fatigue, um, obs <laughs> obsessive thinking, overthinking, as you guys have talked about earlier, right? As a result, mental health issues in young men often go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, meaning far more men are suffering than the statistics reflect. And so there's, you know, some additional stuff here. Uh, thank you, Anton, for bringing that up. But let's start, stop here. So, R Ryan, why do, why do you think that men don't actively go to seek some help, some guidance, counseling, whatever you want to call it, formally or informally, with regards to some of these symptoms and, and feel free to, to speak out on any of these that, that stand out to you? So when I see that list, I hear <clears throat> all I see is trauma-related stressors. So that's what I see. So okay. trauma-related stressors, acute trauma, post-traumatic stress trauma, adjustment disorder, all those types of things. If you don't know what those are, don't worry about it. Don't diagnose yourself if you're hearing this podcast. <laughs> but the idea behind that is there's an event or a situation or an aggression that took place in their life. Sometimes as a child, because between two and six, you're imprinted pretty much. Everything you know is imprinted, and then you can change. But that's what the brain does. It, it secures you. And if you're not secure, it's insecure. Okay, so trauma sets in. Mom and dad are having fights all the time. Dad's a drunk. Mom's a drug addict. You learn that that's the that's the prognosis. And so some men just grow up as a teenager, afraid of the world, afraid of what people think, and they stay in their own isolation and they become trauma led, trauma led. They're trauma led. They're bonded by their trauma. It is their best friend. It is their violent witness that is a healthy witness, a warden that they live with. There's no jailbreak. OK, the other thing is social media, um, newspapers, articles, doesn't matter. You go back to the Washington Post when the, in the 80s when the Washington Post was being printed. I saw a couple of copies of the Washington Post. I was like, this is just like Facebook. And I went back and I started reading books on things like The Power of Awareness by Neville Goddard, which is a book that is tremendous about being aware. They're not aware or the, the world we live in traps us again unconsciously. And we start to worry and we start to fret. Men are not going to say, hey, bro, I'm worried, man. I don't know what to do about this. Because it's not taught that that is okay. So safety is another area. The other area is just flat out ego. I'm a man and you're not. And I'm going to kick your butt. And I'm going to watch football games where people die of concussion syndromes down hmm. the road. And it is a warrior-based world. I'm guilty of it. I love the World Cup. I love the battles. I love that stuff. But they believe that that is the normality. If they were to step back and say, you know what? I'm really, really feeling sad right now. They are fearful of what that identity becomes based on their brotherhoods or their public persona. Okay? Okay. So there's so much here. When I look at the list, I also think about emotional regulation, which is those are symptoms, but the regulation people have is so thwarted reaction versus responding, responding and, and thinking versus feeling. And everything's a feeling a lot of times. I feel this and you don't like me and it's a competition. So there's a lot of competition instead of collaboration. If we were to collaborate more, people would feel safer to be vulnerable. Men are the worst because they feel like if they let somebody down, and I'm guilty of this, that, that, that I've, done, I've done something wrong. I grew up in a society with my family where if I didn't get mine, I wasn't doing them justice. And I was told that because I was the first male grandchild. And it was like, you got to do your thing. And then I was born with this, as you guys know. And I want to show this to people to understand by the time I was in seventh grade, I was an all DC Metro basketball player. I played in the Metro League, in the Beltway League. And Brandon, you're familiar with the Beltway League. Sure. I played in this league as a, I don't know, a five foot seven white kid with a hand. And you know what I was told in the league? <laughs> you can't hang with us. And I hung. I played teams in Montgomery Village and Potomac and Gaithersburg. And these guys were all bigger than me. My point is, I got my fulfillment from that. But when that runs out, you've got nowhere to go. So hmm. you have to be able to create a space. Men don't know how to create a space. And they're afraid that women won't appreciate that space. 
and they're afraid of looking bad. So that's just a little bit of what I'm saying. But when I look at that list, anxiety, depression, I it, it to me they're all they're all a lot alike. Mm-hmm. You know, it creates you know bipolar can be created from this and that, and depression, anxiety. But I think of trauma. Got it. Trauma. That's what I think of. And I think that's the big, that's the big kahuna for me. And I appreciate that. And so Jennifer, what do you think about, you know, any particular, you know, uh, one or, you know, multiple um, of these symptoms that are listed here in this article? No, I, well, just to kind of go back, I appreciate the word safety that you used, Ryan, because I do think um, in general that number one, we need to know who we can share with. Mm -hmm. And the timing and so forth, because you want to also share in a place where, you know, you're not going to be labeled or mocked or your information is used against you, because that is something that unfortunately can happen within our homes, can happen within our cultures, our schools and our churches, et cetera. It can happen wherever place of business. Um, So I love that you mentioned the word safety, because I also think um, that is key for any young man, any young child who's a boy or definitely for any man to be able to share but to also not be taken advantage of. I think it's also important that we're educated. I think education is key because if you have a young son and he may be experiencing certain things, you may miss the signs and just think, oh, he's acting out or he's got bad attitude. But in reality, he may be feeling um, anxious or worried about something. And you've completely diminished that maybe by assuming and jumping in. And not giving him a chance um, of any age to be able to talk and to be able to say, this is what's going on with me. And even just being aware that there are other ways to communicate. Maybe for someone, it is to write it down. Maybe it's to draw a picture. But giving, but be having a sense of awareness, number one, to be educated and then being aware of other tools in order to allow the space for them to be able to share. And I think those were the two things that kind of stuck out to me as you were talking, Ryan, that I really appreciate appreciate it uh, because I, because as I was thinking through the culture, if we can get to a place where people are informed and are aware of what things might look like, right. then we won't be so quick to make a judgment or an assumption. And that in itself will create a space where people and especially men can feel like, wow, the dynamics are changing, the culture's changing, and this is becoming the norm to say, oh, that hurt my feelings, or I was embarrassed that I didn't make the basketball team, or I was frustrated that, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't compete well, or, you know, something didn't go at work the way I was hoping for, or in my marriage, there's certain things that I'm feeling uncomfortable about, but to be able to articulate that in a safe place, with safe people, again, safe people is very crucial. Um, And the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, that I think is really important is not just being aware of the verbal aspect of it, but what we're going through mentally oftentimes affects us physically. You know, I thought about on the page where it talks about, where it mentioned stomach aches or headaches. If we're informed and we're educated again, Maybe the young child's having a headache or a stomach ache, but maybe they're having a back pain. Maybe they're having, like, maybe their chest is beating rapidly. Like, sometimes they're not aware of what's going on. And again, we're not aware. And so I think it's important to be aware. I love the book I shared anytime I can. The Body Keeps the Score. That is an amazing book. But we have to be better as parents, as educators. Um, And this popped in my head, so I'm going to say this out here. A lot of boys get diagnosed with ADHD, um, and they get diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder very young, um, oftentimes when that's not what's necessarily going on. And so we also have to be really careful to be educated and to let the professionals diagnose Uh, Because it can be dangerous if someone, whether it's in the family or whether in the school, starts to make assumptions and it can put a child on a path that is very dangerous that ends up in the juvenile system and eventually can end up in the uh, um, in the prison system. So I just want to throw that out there as well, that we have to be informed. No, no. And I I want to kind of clarify on that ODD thing, because you can't have ODD until you're at least eight or nine. Um, A four year old cannot be oppositional defiant. And most of the time it's major depressive disorder or something like that. The problem is because generations previously in the past have not talked about therapy, 
Therapy was more like a straitjacket thing in the fifties and sixties mm. when my when my parents were in their thirties and forties. It was like, oh, you're you need to be committed, right? Right, right. You talk about that. It kind of it's kind of bled up, right? And so now it's like, let's react or let's call, let's label this kid as a therapist. <laughs> The last thing, and I'm going to say this to any therapist in the world, the last thing that you need to do is use your DSM as your primary responsibility to this, to, to your th- client. It doesn't mean you don't diagnose them. It means you don't label them. Hmm. Because when you do that, especially with men, forget it. And so little boys are impressionable. Little girls are too. I have two girls. They're not little anymore. But the idea behind that is simply this. Don't judge a book by its cover. Find out what's really going on inside. And men have a really difficult time with that, especially fathers, because they don't want to look bad. They don't want their families to look bad. But that came from their father and their father and their father. Not God the father, but, you know, fathers. So anyway, that's just a thought. I, I really appreciate you saying that, Jen, because it's a really, really big thing. Right. And so both of you were talking about, you know, how – how important it is that that we be educated, right? So give me some practicals here. So meaning, is there, would you recommend or is there a way to get this into schools in some form of fashion? At what level of education should this start? And, you know, give me an example of, of how this would look, um, you know, in terms of being able to help help kids. I know that schools do have counselors, right? But, you know, is this something that can be taught somehow or, you know, kind of what are, what are your thoughts and recommend recommendations in terms of actually implementing that? Jen, go ahead. You're good. So I want to speak uh, first to anyone who has a child in the education system. I want to empower you to ask questions first. I want you to, if you have a meeting, for example, with teachers, um, for example, an intervention meeting, and there's a school counselor or a psychologist at hand, you want to know, first of all, what their philosophy is, Hmm. how they go about um, making decisions, and how they go about implementation. Even if you take your child, and I would say this, if you take your child or anyone to see a therapist, even if yourself, if you are going, it is important to know what their um, expertise is in, again, how they go about diagnosing, um, and how they go about um, actually implementing plan and so forth. And those things are important because we make mistakes as professionals. Again, some people can overdiagnose, okay? And so you want to be aware of that. Um, I appreciate you clearing it up. Even with um, oppositional defiant disorder, eight and nine, I think that's too young. That's my personal opinion. That's just my personal. And I know you're, that's true that it can. I worked with two little um, Latino boys in the Alexandria area, and I just thought to myself, these kids are misdiagnosed. Um, and it was very, very alarming in my mind. Uh, but just, but so with that being said, when you try to navigate the school systems or so forth, um, I will say it depends on where you are. I know in our county, there is more mental health that is coming into the system. In fact, they now have people who are on staff in certain schools um, with an outside company to that they're doing programs Good. and there are more opportunities, but that is just the beginning. And I think sure. it's because of the numbers that have gone up. There are other areas where there's no funding mm-hmm. and there's no access. And so maybe other companies will come in or make themselves available. I'm not sure, but I do think that it has to um, happen at the local level and parents have to be interested and really make some headways and really go all the way up to the superintendent so that there can be forward movement and progress. But when you get down to your child, if ever you have an intervention plan or a 504 plan, you want to understand what's going on. If you don't understand what's going on, you want to make sure that you have someone around you who can articulate the different needs that are being met And not only how this affects your child in this particular school year, but how it follows them throughout, um, throughout their education. What can change? What cannot change? Um, And you always want to, to Ryan's point, advocate for the child and not the diagnoses. Okay. Um, And give room when there's growth. And so you want to really make sure that you're aware of these things because you can have children be placed on medication, for example, Mm -hmm. when they don't need to be. 
And if they need to be, please make sure that they're taking it. We have parents on both ends. Be <clears throat> willing to be a learner. Be willing to understand what the brain needs. And I would just say continue to learn and, and gather information and not just be spoon-fed. I think that is so important. If you have a child who needs medication and you say, oh, I'm against medication, but you don't do the research, you're doing more harm than good unintentionally. And so, again, I just think it's so important. I can't say it enough to gather information and to become as informed as you can, because these are the types of things that are also going to teach your child to advocate. And then they'll be able to learn in the educational system how to be, number one, students, learners to be able to thrive in the classroom with their peers educationally and to navigate some of those hardships that come up emotionally um, and physically in settings when they are unnerved, um, embarrassed, anxious, et cetera, whatever could be going on. So that's one thing I want to say from a parent aspect, because that's so crucial. And I think that's where I hear a lot of parents sure. becoming more, um, more concerned and more undone. Sure. So I want to kind of clear, I want to elaborate on that. I have another thought on that too, but the, 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 here's the thing. So they need to put the TDT workers back into the schools. Number oh, one. So I'm sorry, can you clarify that? TDT, TDT is a therapeutic day treatment worker who okay. is a counselor type person. School counselors are great, but they're most guidance based. So that's the first thing. It does need to start at the local. Okay. I agree with that for the schools. On a university level, and you know what's happened here in, in Charlottesville, what happened here about a month ago, it was yeah. horrible, horrible. Yeah. And, and, and it's not the first, and look, I am going to talk real. It is not the first issue that this city has dealt with in the last five years. You know about the racial riots, there's been abductions, there's been murders, it's not being discussed because we don't want to bring it out in the open, right? Okay. But at the college level, I have a major beef. And here's my beef. You get three or four sessions as a college student on average at any university. The need for the federal government, I said the federal, to install grants for state universities and require them to have quality professionals on their campuses is a must. Too many kids are dying on campus for no reason other than the lack of mental health. And most of the people that are getting killed are being done by males. And it doesn't matter what color or creed so that's my thought on schools. It would be so helpful to spend more dollars on this, and I'm going to say it, and I'm a huge sports fan, than the athletic department. It's time. It's overdue. My second point is this. Yeah. With this whole educationing people, let's go to churches and nonprofits and things of this nature. Every church needs to have a psychologist or a social worker or a professional counselor on their staff if they're big enough, if they can afford it. You want to hire a staff member, you hire one of them. Why? They can help understand the neglect that people who come mm. into churches with baggage, when that baggage isn't going to go away totally, they're going to have mm. to work through it. And I'm being very careful what I say here <clears throat> and churches and all that stuff. I'm talking about in general. Mm -hmm. In order to enhance the understanding and advocate for people that really want to know God, really want their lives to change, could be nonprofits they're part of, organizations, that piece, that link of a, of a professional or someone who is in training would totally change the dynamic of that institution because there's families and there's kids and there's play schools and preschools. I know you guys go to church where there's a, a school inside and there's other churches that have that. And there's, so that is my thought. That is the objective correlation I see. And I would so, add to your point, I'm so sorry. I was just going to say, I would add that we would need to also allow for those who are licensed in the mental health field to be able to cross states. For example, when there's an ex uh, a disaster, the federal government will allow social workers from all over to go to, for example, if there was a tornado, they could go to a certain 
state right. that they're not from. We need to be able to allow that because there is a, still a great need for mental health workers. Licensing as well is a big issue. Um, it is. A it is. major right. issue and the hoops that many have to go through to be able to be licensed. So that's a, that's another podcast. Uh, no, um, no, no, no. Go ahead. I'll, I'll and, and, and again, and even with that, within those who are licensed, state crossing as well. And so I think I think there's definitely different components, but at the from the federal perspective as well, I will say there has to be something that allows for us to make mental health a major component. I know that we used to have therapeutic people in within the schools in the county. For some reason, they were moved out. They also used to have groups coming in and they were right. And, mm-hmm. um, and I do know from certain teachers, they were saying, actually social workers, they were saying that also to not aligning with what was under the, anyway, that's political. We won't get into politics. Sure. <laughs> However, it has to be, again, where we see the best need and where we where we put our value. I think it's also where we put our value because we will put any amount of money into our sports, for example, yeah. but we have mm-hmm. to show that we want the whole being because many of these kids don't go on to do different things. And you gave a great example. Where do you go once you lose the very outlet that you've had, whether it's art, music, et cetera, mm-hmm. where, do, where do you go when you <clears throat> lose that outlet? And so I think it's so important that we make sure that these children are given the tools while they're in school. And I think it would be great to add it as a class. No, no, they're I agree taught. With that. No, yeah. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. I also agree with the fact there is a compact law going around right now. With yes, it needs to pass. Virginia is not one of those states. I repeat. It is not. It's not. And so it is not. The reason I know that is because I'm going to get reciprocity in certain states so I can actually practice in those states when I'm in those particular states. But very good point, Jen. That's an incredibly important point. This and I know that because we drove all the way to North Carolina for something. And I was so disappointed that we couldn't continue. And uh, but I I will say we we are behind. And so hopefully every state can yeah. be on the same. And the compact the needs same to be done so people can be treated properly and when they need it. So, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. No, this is this is fantastic. And, and, and Anton, if you could bring that article back up, um, I just want to go through a couple of, you know, I want to go through one um, one thing here that I think is really um, important. And it's it's, you know, the topic of depression. Um, you know, there, I think it's become much more prevalent, right? Um, during COVID and post COVID, uh, I firmly believe that God has created us to be relational beings, right? To have interaction with people. And so there are so many people, unfortunately, through, uh, let's say the eight, nine months, uh, of COVID in 2020 from March through the end of the year. And of course, for a good portion of last year, that really took a step back. And, and, and I'm sure for a lot of, a lot of good reasons in terms of their own physical and mental health, right? Being worried, being scared, not wanting to get sick, so much going on. And I know that's a a different type of topic, but regardless, depression has been going on so far, you know, before this. And, you know, it says here, I'm going to go ahead and read this for our audience. It says male depression is one of the biggest mental health issues in men. Um, Center for Disease Control, CDC statistics show that 5.5% of young adult males suffer from depression. That's about half the number of women of the same age. But while male depression is diagnosed less often than women, many young men have depression that is not identified by their doctor because their symptoms are less typical of major depressive disorder. Furthermore, while men are less likely to receive depression diagnoses and also attempt suicide at lower rates than women, they are 3.7 times more likely to die by suicide, according to the National Institutes of Mental Health. That's because men who attempt suicide use more deadly methods, particularly firearms. In addition, since young adults attempt suicide at higher rates than any other age group, young men are at extremely high risk. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Because d- depression is, is, a, is a big deal. And depression and discouragement are very, very powerful things. And, you know, I think you had talked a little bit about um, kind of the suicide and and things before, Ryan. It's like if you look at, you know, in particular men who have, you know, or either in the military or come out of the military, 
there's a lot of suicide that takes place. Or if you look at older men who are no longer working, especially like executives, right? There are higher suicide rates. Or if you look at depression in athletes who no longer are on the field, who no longer are receiving the accolades and the crowd noise and the attention, now they're suffering from depression. So yeah. can both of you really speak to that? Because to me, um, again, as being a man, as being a father, um, as being active you know, in the, in the community, I definitely see this as being a, a major issue that we need to be open about, understand and talk about. So go ahead, go ahead Ryan. Yeah, I think that the, for, for, let me start with this. I think uh, the education of parenting is an, is, a, is an important commodity here, not a reaction, but a response. And I think seeing it as a, uh, as a tool of, of, of effectiveness and being able to communicate <clears throat> with your children. Um, you know, I have two girls. I don't have, I don't have boys, but um, you know, my daughter, my oldest daughter suffered from Lyme's disease for years and she's, and you guys know her and, and you've seen her and she's now in Boston doing great thriving. Um, but if I don't communicate with her, even if she doesn't want me to, if I don't ask her what she's thinking and I, and then I let her tell me it's, it's a, it's a cry and shame. So I think the first thing for men, especially boys, young boys with fathers and mothers is moms, give your father, give your husband the out of boy, you can do this. And, and husbands don't be afraid to just have these conversations, not serious all the time. It can be very, very uh, intimidating for a young boy who's 14 years old, who feels insecure to feel like he has to meet these expectations. I believe that that actually creates more suicidal tendencies than anything. 18 to 25 year old males are second in the leading cause of suicide. Mm. 18 to 25, you leave high school, you're in college, life sucks, your girlfriend dumped you, the, the fraternity blackballed you, you suck, heroin's available on the corner, you take it once and bam, you're screwed. Mm. Okay, UVA is leading the way in drugs, my friend. That's all I'm going to say. Not going to make any more. But my point is, it's got to be a communication process at the start, and and that process has to be something that's favorable to the to the to the teens. Teens want reality. They want realness. We need discipline. They need discipline. Yeah, but most of them don't want to be bad kids. Most of them want to do the right thing. They just don't understand how to sometimes. And as parents, we 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 have to take off the veil of a parent sometimes and be a parent without a rule and be more real and genuine. So I think that's where that starts with the suicide issue, especially with males. The other part of it is the pressure to be men. Mm -hmm. And the pressure to be men is brutal. Man. I mean, you just watch commercials on TV. And Get what right does that mean? <laughs> so, yeah. Like, what do you... What do you want me to be? You want me to be a chiseled dude like the Calvin Klein guy doing the cologne commercial? Who has? What does it mean? What do you? What do you? You expect me to go and, and, and lift up the Ford Ford F one fifty over my head? What do you? I mean, what in the world? Like, I mean, are you think I'm as fast as you know Michael Jordan? And you know, uh, come on! I mean, it's it's here. It's 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 unrealistic. Okay, let's just call a spade a spade. So. My thought on the suicide rate and the thing is trauma, but it's not just the military guys either. Like, what happens is these guys walk in and they have these, these, these patterns of, you know, my dad won't talk to me. He won't hear me. I had a kid in my, in my office, my house, in my office yesterday. <clears throat> he was 14 and, and his parents are divorced and they both have custody. And, and everything we talk about is his dad, dad, dad. So I said, enough. I'm getting his parents in my office next week and I'm calling his dad to the carpet. And his dad's not going to like it. But guess what? I need him to like it because he's losing his son. Mm. So that's the first thing. Understanding your role. It doesn't have to be this overbearing thing for kids, especially boys. They want to be part of a great thing. But when they feel the pressure, they sink to trauma and to tension and to failure. So... Yeah. Jennifer, Jennifer, any thoughts on that? No. Well, actually, yes. I was debating if I should share this or not. Um, I'm going to have someone that I'm hoping is going to come on my podcast. But I heard a very powerful story of a woman who was married, who is a licensed um, mental health professional and saw all of the signs that she recognized in her husband. And in fact, was doing everything that she possibly could 
um, actively to get others to assist and to even try to get her husband to um, to get the help that was so desperately needed. Unfortunately, he did end up taking his life. Mm. Um, and there were different, there were many different things that were taking place internally and also externally. One thing though, was that she, as she shared, um, people really didn't believe her and what she was seeing. So I think um, a couple of things, we have to be willing to listen and we have to be willing to be, when it comes to someone's life, to be wrong <laughs> um, and, and to do everything we can to understand. There were people who I'm sure if they had the opportunity to go back and this, let me say, if someone's going to take their life, it is never your fault. You, if they're going to do it, you, you likely will not be able to stop very good. it. That's a very good if, comment. Yeah. But let me also say that it is very preventable. So oftentimes people aren't having the conversation or the dialogue because we're afraid. We don't know what to do. And, and there are, again, so many other reasons for that. But I think it's so important that we create safe places, number one, um, again, for people to be able to talk, that we do know the signs. So again, we have to be educated, know the signs. We also have to know the resources. We're not always the best person. No, nope, um, and That's and and be okay with that. Be nope. okay, mom, dad. If you are not the best person, if you are not who your child will talk to, it is yeah. okay. Yep. It is okay. Yep. Give yourself permission to get other resources, other trusted, safe people mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say was that the one thing that she mentioned that really stuck out to me, going back to the story as she was sharing about her husband, was that in his mind he had a picture of what it meant for him to be a man. And in his mind, that picture was not being lived, uh, yeah. was not being. And so as a result, whatever was taking place, and there was a combination of things, and she would, she shared all of those different combinations that led to it. It wasn't one thing. Um, but what she shared was that, you know, he had gotten <clears throat> to a point where he no longer saw himself being able to give. And there is something that I've always been fascinated by. I know like my husband, and I've had conversations about this, about, you know, that need to be able to provide, to yeah. give, to, to live up to something, whatever that is. And he no longer felt that he was able to do that. And so I think we have to at least, and this is just a, a thought, um, not an answer, because this is a God, I, I'm going to take from Kyle Spears, who was on my podcast. This is a God sized problem. Um, and I don't have God can, God has the answer. Um, but I think it's important to remove the expectation of what we think, even have that conversation. What do you think it means to be a man? What do you think it means to, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like let's, let's start to have that conversation. Um, mm -hmm. really giving the, the room for it's okay to make mistakes. Yeah. It's okay to, to, to weave and to have ups and downs that life is not fair, that there are going to be disappointments. How do we handle those things? Really giving tools for that. I think that's an important part because I think there's such a pressure of perfection um, mm. that cannot be met. And I can't imagine how discouraging that is to feel that you have to be perfect and you have to live up to this expectation and to constantly feel like you are not meeting it to the point to where you are better off not here than being yeah. here. And yeah. so if you're listening and you're feeling this, please know that you are loved, that you are needed, that you are valued, um, and that and that there is help and that there is help. And so, Ryan, I really do appreciate just some of the things that you've been pointing out, because I think if we can continue to put things in place, then more and more people will have the education and the tools to be able to get help. And the one thing I want to share with therapists or social workers real quick before we transition. I know Brandon wants to transition. I can see it on his face. So um, <laughs> it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. You're keeping me, you're keeping me, you're keeping me, you're keeping me in line because I could talk all day on this is if you are in a particular situation with a client or number one, you're a mandated reporter. You are a mandated reporter, mm. but the way you ask somebody is crucial in terms, especially with boys and men, Look, most boys, they just want it straight up. Man. 
doesn't matter. Straight up now tell me, just like Paul Abdul said, all right? Look, it doesn't matter <laughs> if they're black, white, Latino, Indonesian, Vietnamese. Just ask them. You got a plan to kill yourself? People go, you say it like that? I go, bingo. I go, wait, what's your plan? You got a, you got a gun? You got anything? Have you sold anything? No, 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 no. That's going to help them understand that two things. You care. And they really don't want to do it at this point. It's going to give them a piece. You, I promise that. That's all I got to say on that. Go ahead. No, I, well, <clears throat> we're not necessarily going to transition too much, but I appreciate that real talk, Ryan, because I think what happens is we're so politically correct. We're so timid, right? That we, we sometimes can be afraid to say exactly what things are. And Jen, when you were talking, it really made me think, you know, about the word comparison. And, you know, um, you know, comparison, in my opinion, especially with men, but of course, with 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 women and little girls and social media, which is something we'll talk about another time. But it, it yeah. just it just opens the door like French doors, you know, for stress. <laughs> French and, for, man. What can be Italian, man? Come on. And Italian <laughs> European doors are opened right for dis for depression, stress you know, anxiety, you know, because when we compare ourselves, like you said, Ryan, also to this unattainable visage, this picture of someone, it really, we really get down. I was listening to the podcast. I listened to the Brian Buffini podcast. It's called The Good Life. And he shared a quick story about this and it, just yesterday. And it was so funny. I was listening and he said, uh, a long story short, there was a business person that he met and this business person's daughter was the spokesperson of their company. And she was beautiful online, this, that, and the other. She's a spokesperson, beautiful model. He met her in person and he, it seemed like she was a different person. Like she was like, are, he was like, is this the same person that I've seen online? Because they made her out to look so different than she was in reality. And I think that's the thing. Like we don't see the reality of what's going on with men. And so we try to live up to this image that is Photoshopped, right? That is unattainable. And it's done like that on purpose. And, you know, back in like in the eighties and the nineties, so many young girls had eating disorders. And even today, because of these skinny models, right? Walking down a runway and they've starved themselves, and it's like, for what reason and for what purpose? And so that comparison, comparison goes back to the beginning of time where Satan compared himself to God and he wanted to be like God and God banished him from heaven as a result. And we are suffering, you know, a lot of the, that sin and those results in, in various ways even today. And that's something yeah. that I want us to talk about in our next part two of this podcast, because we didn't get to one of our major topics, which is going to be Christian ethics versus social ethics. So we are going to talk about that in part two, Ryan, of our podcast <laughs> with yourself and Jennifer, because that that's, that's a major topic. But as we finish off, please, any final thoughts, anything that you've been reading or anything that's been on your heart and your mind that's come yeah. up during this particular podcast yeah. that you would like to share? First of all, thanks for having me on. It's been great. And um, uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of give a little taste, a little, a little flirtation to the Christian realism thing before we go. So I've been doing a lot of of, of research and study on many different uh, areas, including uh, a gentleman named Reinald Niebar, who is a German minister back in the 20s and 30s, who is well known for the book Moral Man and Moral Society, uh, An American Conscious. These are books that are written on the ideals of what it really means to, to transfer political, economic, and religious ethics into realism. And I think to me, this is a great book for people to read when it comes to understanding that just because you have a moral code doesn't mean you so, you're socially involved in change. You need to be socially involved in change. You need to speak for the truth, like Jen talked about with education and schools and the need for people to understand that background. The other thing I'm reading, I've read on is a book by a guy named uh, Howard Thurman, who was an African-American minister back in the 30s called Jesus and the Disinherited, which is a fantastic book for people, not just about the race issues, but just about the ideals of what God really was on earth as Jesus mm. that we, you know, and what it really means to be suffering as opposed to not saying anything to stand up for your ideals. 
Um, another book that I've been reading is a book, um, uh, Waking the Dead by, uh, I think it's by John Eldridge. It's another book I've read, but just a lot of books on the idea that we need to have an individual perspective of God before we have an organizational perspective and the Bible, of course. But my point is you can read the Bible over and over and over again and never, never get a different result. You need to be able to add substance to that stamina. And so those are some things I'm studying. Um, I'm also uh, looking into uh, books on, uh, and you're going to think this is crazy, but uh, imperialism, utilitarianism, and colonialism. Because if we think about the global history of our country and our world, oppression has been around since the Ottoman Empire, since the Turks were here, since the British Empire, since the Spanish Armada. We're living in this era, but that is still being lived out in many of the things we're dealing with because we're not advocating for the right sentiments. So I'm looking forward to that next that part too. That's going to be fun. Oh, absolutely. No, I appreciate that for sure, Ryan. And Jen, you got anything you want to end with? I just want to, number one, thank you, Ryan, for being here. And yes. thank you for having me on as well. This has been fun. And I just uh, wanted to mention, again, just when it comes to men and mental health, obviously I am not a man, but I do want to encourage you that if you are um, – having some emotions or feelings or thoughts or even um, things that being expressed in your body and you're unsure about what's going on. So this is a wonderful time to speak to your doctor, to speak to a mental health professional. And there are other ways to get help. It's not all therapy. Um, there are other ways um, to be able to get help, to learn how to release emotion, to learn how to have yeah. dialogue, to learn how to really be able, sometimes too, sometimes you may be feeling down mentally, but really there's something going on physically, you know, going to your doctor, getting checked out. Um, but really, this is a time to take care of you. I want to give men the permission, if you don't feel you have it, to take care of your whole well-being yeah. because okay. you do matter. You are important. And this is why we wanted to have this podcast, because we want to make sure that those statistic numbers that are so high for men start to come down um, and that hopefully one day we can all have zeros all across the board. But you are not a label. You are not a diagnosis. You are human. And we just want to encourage you to continue to have your experience in the best healthy way possible. Awesome. Thank you again. This is been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you both for being on here. This has been educational. Um, it's been sobering, but it's also been inspiring. And I really look forward to, you know, reading some of the books that you've mentioned. Um, I'll make sure that we put all of those resources in the show notes so that people can look at those uh, those books and the, the articles that we've had up. And, you know, for, yes, for anyone out there, you know, who really needs that help, I encourage you to really listen to this even again, because there's so much authentic and, you know, and true heartfelt um, professional advice, you know, here, you know, and go to those who are safe, you know, go to those who love you, go to those who care, whether, you know, you're on one extreme or definitely the other. But it, at the end of the day, this is absolutely a, it's a broad topic, but it's one that, that sorely needs to be discussed um, over and over again. And I really appreciate the both of you. And I look forward to having you both on again very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. No problem. All right, people, this has been another amazing podcast with Vision to Mission, talking about an extremely important topic today on men's mental health. Please give us all of your comments and any of your thoughts and suggestions. We look forward to interacting and engaging with you. Love you all. Take care, peace, and God bless.